experience, we're actually taking something that otherwise would be mulched or burned or tossed away, and we're making it into a durable product. When people are afraid, whether it's because of the election result or um, some set of experience, part of what we're trying to do is validate that experience for them um, so that they know that that's uh, really valid and really want to honor that that's where they are right now, um, if afraid is what they're feeling. This is going to create a moment of transition that Cuba is already preparing for right now and it is opening a moment of opportunity to change policy in Washington as well. Hello and welcome to University Beat. I'm Denise White. We've done several stories on this program about the new Lynn Pippinger Hall on USF St. Petersburg campus. The building will house the Kate Tiedemann College of Business. And to make way for it, dozens of oak trees had to be removed. But the trees are getting a second life in the form of furniture and artwork for the new building. The project not only helps the environment, but also local business. Hedel Gandhi reports. Boards filled with hope from a tree named Defiant that stood on what is now the USF St. Petersburg campus for about 200 years. Thanks to local woodworkers like Pete Richardson, Defiant and other trees are getting a second life. And I actually didn't call it Defiant, I think the students did, because some of them were really still upset, even though they knew that it was going to be recycled and recovered trees, they were still upset that the biggest tree had to go down, and it did because it was in the footprint of the USF building, the K. Tiedemann Business College, and the root structure on it was where all the pipelines and power lines and all that stuff were going to go. It had to go, but it didn't want to go. Defiant, one of 32 live oaks cleared to make room for the new K. Tiedemann College of Business at Lynn Pippinger Hall. It was a hard tree, it dull blades, and at the very end, the tree climber had stripped off almost all the branches, and it was a fairly big trunk, and it had one big branch sticking up in the air. So it didn't want to go down, so it didn't go, out, go down without a fight, and it, its last photo was basically giving a finger to everyone. So we called it defiant. Those trees, they can be used for so many other things than just going into the landfill. Local business people are partnering with USF St. Petersburg to give new life to Defiant and the other trees as tables, benches, and art to furnish the business college where they once stood. So we're actually taking something that otherwise would be mulched or burned or tossed away and we're making it into a durable product. It, does, it can save other trees having to go down because of the demand for them. Enormous branches from Defiant's sister Starry Night will become tables. Starry Night was all black on the outside. It was the second biggest tree. And that one had an unusual bark pattern on it of swirls. And when the bark actually was, came off, you could see the swirls in it. It looked just like the painting of Starry Night. Each piece is carefully separated from the next to dry. For a year, imagine if all of this had gone to waste. Joe Pettit and Pete Richardson are among eight small business owners in St. Petersburg who are benefiting from more than $100,000 generated by the project. One piece of Starry Night now belongs to Lynn Pippinger, the generous donor for whom Lynn Pippinger Hall is named. I think it's a great idea, and I have a desktop out of one of those trees, and it's beautiful. It's, it's just a really good example to the students to show that we don't just have to toss something aside, that we can actually repurpose it, reuse it, and make something that, that now it's gonna have a second life. Students are proud of the university's commitment to sustainability. I think that maybe ingraining a philosophy of sustainability in the students here at the school is definitely really important. That can actually like benefit us and the environment, so we don't have to like you have these plants like you know wasting away and turning into methane or any like products that can be harmful to the environment. Defiant Second Life begins on the fourth floor of this building, not far from his sister's, as a 16-foot-long, 5-foot-wide table in the Dean's Conference Room. New life in the same space where his enormous branches once danced in the sunlight. For University Beat, I'm Hedel Gandhi. 
It's the time of year when many USF students are making important decisions about health care. The College of Public Health recently brought insurance advisors to the Marshall Center. These advisors, also known as navigators, help to answer students' questions about the health insurance marketplace. We see often most students don't really understand health insurance, so they need help uh, understanding tax credits, but also um, they get other discounts like the cost sharing, which brings down things like deductibles, the out-of-pocket costs. Um, we don't find that most students can articulate what co-insurance and co-pays are and how they work and how to look at networks and figure out what your um, needs are when it comes to your own health care. The kids need everything. A lot of times we run into the Young Invincibles, that's what they're known as, um, you know, across Navigator Land. Um, they're known as Young Invincibles because they think that they're just invincible to everything. They think that, you know, nothing will happen for them. But what we've been seeing is that a lot of these young invincibles on campus are taking charge of their health. So they're asking things about like, you know, well, what happens if I have a sports injury? Or what happens if I get a cold? Or what happens if there's something that Student Health Services is not able to address for me? And so they come to us with those kinds of questions. She helped me find the plans. I don't think I would have been able to do it by myself because there's a lot on there to navigate through. And she knew exactly what she was doing. So that worked out for me. Healthcare navigators are at USF year-round to answer questions not only from students, but also from the public. For an appointment or for more information, go to www.coveringflorida.org or you can call 877-813-9115. Both the call and the appointment are free. The election of Donald Trump as our new president will likely bring changes on a number of fronts, among them health care and possibly other public health policies. Dr. Jay Wolfson is the Associate Vice President for Health Law, Policy and Safety and the Senior Associate Dean at USF's Morsani College of Medicine and he joins us now on University Beat. Welcome Dr. Wolfson. Thank you Denise, it's a pleasure to be here. Well what, what a change um, health care and public policy may go through with the election of Donald Trump. Um, first of all, he has talked about dismantling the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. But now there seems to be some signals from him uh, that he may not get rid of everything, uh, that he is stepping back and may allow some elements of the program, like pre-existing uh, conditions, uh, letting children stay on their parents' um, health insurance until age 26, that the perhaps uh, he'll keep those two parts of Obamacare. What's your read on what might happen going forward to the Affordable Care Act? First, I think it's important to segregate the benefit plan that's called Obamacare from the rest of the Affordable Care Act that has lots of other stuff in it that's very important and that both Democrats and Republicans often agree about. I think Democrats and Republicans also agree that pre-existing conditions in the plan really are bad for almost everybody and that it's a great idea in our current economy, especially when we have young people coming back from Afghanistan and overseas, not able to find jobs after their military deployment, to be able to be under parents' plan. So that, those are things that we, we find a, a, attractive, but we have to pay for them. The other things that are attractive to everybody are the closing of the donut hole in Medicare Part B so that seniors don't have to go for a period of time during the year when they have some coverage for pharmaceuticals and then there's this gap where they have to pay out of pocket and then maybe Medicare Part D will pick up again. That's going to close down. So I, I think that it's also critical to recognize that when the Affordable Care Act was implemented, it was very broad in scope and its drafters said, there's a lot here that needs to be fixed, and we'll fix that later. Many of us recognize that the plan had structural and financial deficits that would not allow it to continue operating as it was built the first day. And we found those things to be true these last three or four years as With rates went up. With the premiums going up. Premiums going up. Mm -hmm. Large carriers in the country saying, we don't want to play with this any longer. The large insurance companies. I call them financial services corporations. Uh, and backing away uh, the, the electronic issues with gaining access to the program. Many people who are covered under the provisions of the benefit plan are subsidized. Right. So they get a, a very robust set of benefits and they don't have to pay anything out of pocket. But for others in America, for many middle class Americans who don't qualify for the subsidy, they have to buy a plan that includes a deductible. Now, some of them pay two, three, five, I know people who are paying six and seven hundred dollars a month for premiums. That's what the premiums have become. 
and then they find out that they have a deductible that can be anywhere from $3,000 to $7,000, and most Americans don't have that money. So when they go to seek care, they say, I can't afford this. So it's deterred many people from continuing to seek care, and then the hospitals have to find a way to collect that money anyway. There are a lot of wonderful things about the Affordable Care Act. The Obamacare portion of the benefit plan had structural and actuarial or financial flaws built into it, and the mandate part of it is something that many of us felt created some real challenges. While the Supreme Court agreed that it was a tax and therefore it was constitutional, some people continued to believe that it wasn't going to work. It's like saying, Denise, I know you don't eat broccoli, but I'm going to make you buy it. Right. And I don't even care if you eat it, but you're going to have to buy it. There's just something that doesn't fit there. What would you say are the top public health um, issues in the Tampa Bay area? Obesity remains a huge challenge for us in the Tampa Bay area and throughout Florida. Our children are getting fatter. They're eating yucky food. Uh, they're still sitting behind their, 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 their games. They don't go out for recess. They don't Even have now, after the, you know, we've had eight years or more of talking about healthy we've eating. We've talked about it a lot. And the First Lady has made a tremendous effort to create an awareness. I think we've gotten to a point where we hear it. It's kind of like smoking. You know, smoking in Florida now is at its lowest rates in history for adults and for adolescents. But it's taken us 30 years to get here. We have to hear the message, we have to believe the message, we have to say then it, it applies to me, not just to you, mm -hmm. and then I, I have to have some things that I can do to make that message apply to me and my community. Well, you know, the other big issue, of course, uh, in parts of the country that we hadn't seen before until in recent years uh, is heroin use. Uh, heroin and opioid use, yeah. Yes, in, uh, in, in Midwestern states, that was kind of a new thing, um, but it's a big thing now. Of course, drug use and drug abuse has been a problem in the country for years and years and years and years. Um, so the heroin and other opiates, what are we seeing locally, though? Are we seeing the same level of that kind of It's growing of faster here. It's not, it's not as fast as it is in some parts of, of the state and in some parts of the country, but it's growing here. Heroin is it's cheap. It's cheaper than some of the opioids. Uh, it's, it's relatively easy to get, uh, and people are using it. We're having a, a spike, a spike in deaths associated with heroin and opioids. Are you seeing students being drawn to the public health? Oh, uh, yes. My goodness, policies? public health and medicine and nursing are f we're training some of their people together. And we've had the largest application classes for those, those programs in our school's history at USF. It's wonderful. That is And awesome. these are people who are committed to providing care and serving people, not just to carving out an income-based career. Thank you so much for joining us. My it's pleasure. Been an exciting um, discussion, and let's hope things work out well as we go forward in the future for public health care and policy. These Dr. are exciting and dynamic times, and it's up to us. Yes, Dr. Jay Wolfson, thank you. We are approaching what can be a difficult time of year for college students. There can be many issues. Exams are looming, so are the holidays, which can be trying for many people. Even the election could have been very stressful. And some students are away from home for the first time. So where can they turn to for help? At USF, they have the Counseling Center. Uh, for some students, um, you know, by this time they've gotten like their first grades and their midterm grades and so right now they're just aware of how much they might need to put out to really pass a class or do well and so all of that can be really stressful if they haven't um, sort of been applying themselves all the way through the semester and so we'll work with them on relaxation skills, study skills, just planning and organizational skills to sort of get them through that last push. If you get a B, if you get a C, if you fail one exam, um, it's not the end of the world because it can really feel like game over. <laughs> and so um, helping them to do some reality checking about what um, making some mistakes or not doing as well, um, that that's normal and real and okay and we can survive it. Um, for students that the holidays are stressful for, um, sometimes um, some of our students come from 
um, difficult family backgrounds. And so school actually is a really nice break from their families, or it might be um, a place of safety when people are afraid, whether it's because of the election result or um, some sort of experience. Part of what we're trying to do is validate that experience for them um, so that they um, you know, know that that's a really valid and really want to honor that that's where they are right now. Um, if afraid is what they're feeling. And then kind of think about what are ways that we can increase their sense of safety. A lot of what students need and lots of us need when we're stressed out is a safe place to just talk about what's going on and feel like we're really being understood and heard. And I think a lot of us um, move really quickly to trying to solve problems for people we love because it's hard to see them in distress. And uh, what we know um, from doing this work is that lots of our students actually are aware of some of their own potential solutions. And so if they can get a safe space to kind of talk about what's going on and what they're afraid of or what they're stressed out about, um, you can help them slow down enough to kind of think, well, what do you think your resources are? What do you think your options are? And which of those things do you think would be most helpful? American relations with Cuba have warmed considerably under President Obama. One example is the new airline service between Tampa and Havana, but under President-elect Trump, that relationship could change. USF Sarasota Manatee recently marked the International Education Week with a panel discussion on Cuba and its future with the U.S. Mark Schreiner reports. The USF Sarasota Manatee Global Engagement Office had been planning the discussion on Cuba since March, but the focus had to be adjusted a week before the event when Donald Trump won the presidential election. President Obama is associated with this Cuba opening. Part of what I wanted to show was that it actually precedes President Obama. This, this concept is bigger than just the past eight years. And so I, I think seeing the historical dimensions of people-to-people -people relationships, economic goals, the things that transcend pol politics. And so that, having chosen that focus, I think we were able to stick to that concept pretty effectively, even with change. Panelists focused on a trio of issues, the history of U.S.-Cuba relations, Cuban arts and literature, and business and tourism possibilities. Johannes Werner is editor of the Miami-based online business news site, Cuba Standard. He says while removing trade barriers with the U.S. could greatly improve Cuba's economic strength, opening up the country further could also be a boon for a number of American industries. On the U.S. side, Cuba is fairly small, but interest has been peaked by the uh, tourism-related industries. You have large cruise corporations, hotel companies, and the airlines that are very interested and that actually already have a small stake in the Cuban market. At the moment, he's not exactly sure what a Trump presidency means for relations with Cuba, but he believes the Cuban people are looking at the change with optimism. Essentially what they hope is that the status quo will be maintained. In other words, the small openings that were created by the Obama administration should continue might continue from the Cubans' perspective. That's at least what they hope at this point. Werner also points to February 2018 as a greater potential turning point. That's when Raul Castro is expected to end his last term as Cuban president. This is going to create a moment of transition that Cuba is already preparing for right now, and it is opening a moment of opportunity to change policy in Washington as well. Dr. Madeline Camera was born in Cuba, teaching at the University of Havana before coming to the U.S. 24 years ago. She pointed out that arts and literature need to be considered alongside things like business when Americans look at other countries. What I don't like to see is the subordination, like this come later, let's go and travel to Cuba, make business, and well, well we can get informed about literature. No, no, no. You have to previously know who is Cuba. Cuba is that island that is still a promise, so you have to reach for that. Even though she sometimes goes years without speaking to her family still in Cuba, she thinks things will eventually change. We need to hear these dissonant voices that don't want to continue in a communist country with only one party. So that being said, yes, it's room for optimism. And due to continuing restrictions, Camera is not allowed to go back to her native land without an expensive visa that she refuses to buy.
just, uh, I'm a Cuban citizen, I will come back to my country when I just get a plane and be there. So I'm waiting for that day. I will wait more, more than 20 years, so <laughs> that's doesn't make a change to wait a little bit more. The discussion fits into the mission of both USF Sarasota Manatee and the USF system of educating students and the public about the world around them. USF has been very dynamic along those lines, talking about world education, world culture, world citizens. And the global initiatives, we, we want to make sure that at our campus we follow that policy because it'll make them a better, it'll make our students more marketable, it'll also show them new horizons that they can take with them and make USF look good. For University Beat, I'm Mark Schreiner. Prospective students who want to attend USF for one reason or another were not admitted now have another pathway to the university, and this one guarantees admission. The program is called FUSE. It's a partnership among USF and seven regional colleges in Florida. Students in the program will first earn their associate's degree, then move directly into a bachelor's degree program at USF. Does you enter? Uh, with an AA degree in hand uh, into USF and uh, into the USF system. So it may not just be at USF Tampa, but it could be at USF St. Petersburg or USF Sarasota Manatee. But as you enter the University of South Florida system, you are fully prepared to graduate on uh, an accelerated path. Uh, and be ready to move out into high demand, high skilled, high paid jobs in the Tampa Bay marketplace or to move on to some of the most competitive graduate schools and medical schools and law schools uh, across this nation and around the world. There are many reasons for a student to attend a regional college prior to a four-year university. One of the most common is to save money. Many families uh, have uh, face economic challenges and uh, the prospect of paying tuition at a four-year school like the University of South Florida for four years uh, may be a bit of a reach. So to be able to know that they are uh, admitted not just to a state college but also to the University of South Florida pending completion of their AA, AA degree and a prescribed pathway of courses leading them into a specific major at the University of South Florida is attractive to them. The FUSE program began earlier this year and is expected to be fully implemented by next summer. A new study has ranked 100 U.S. cities on how green they are. The study measured things like air quality, how walkable and bikeable a city is, the use of renewable energy like solar power, water quality, and use of green space. The study was done by Wallet Hub, a personal finance website. Using data from the Census Bureau and other sources, the company determined that Tampa was near the bottom of the list at number 94. St. Petersburg fared a bit better, coming in at number 89. We asked Professor Robert McLeod, who directs the USF School of Architecture and Community Design, for some tips on how to make our lives and our city a little greener. I think the average person can do a few very simple things. They can recycle. It's obvious. You know, most of the towns in the region ask you to do that anyway. Um, you can turn the thermostat up a degree or two. You can install ceiling fans or use fans to keep yourself a little bit cooler. Try to take advantage of the environment this time of year where you can crack your windows open and things like that. One of the most obvious things you can do for your own home is plant trees. Um, you'll be astonished by uh, the impact it will have on your electricity bill if you can just shade your house from a so southern or westerly sun. If you can keep the sun off glass, if you can keep the sun off the roof, um, makes a big difference. Something as simple as parks and green spaces that encourage people to walk, move from place to place, so you're not just walking from A to B, but you're walking from A to B with kind of a beautiful experience. Shaded um, uh, spaces, shaded streets, parks, and so forth. Uh, one tree will filter something like close to 100 gallons of water in a rainfall, and that's water that doesn't have to move into the storm, um, storm sewers. If you can ride your bike, great. Why not get out and ride your bike? If you can use different forms of um, transportation, if you can take the bus, if you can 
use uh, public transportation in as much as we have it in this region, why not take advantage of that? If you can take advantage of the kind of emerging sharing culture, um, the sharing economy, if you can use Uber instead of drive your own car, if you can share with your friends and take a vehicle like that, why not? The top-ranked green city in the survey was San Francisco, followed by Honolulu and San Jose, California. If you want to share a comment about the show, you can reach us via the WUSF Public Media app. Just look for the Contact tab and write University Beat in the content line. You can also email us. The address is ubeat at wusf.org. Our website is universitybeattv.org. We are also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find us by searching University Beat TV. And that's University Beat for this week. We'll be going on hiatus, but you can see past episodes on our website and on YouTube. I'm Denise White. For all of us at University Beat, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>